Greetings, Dave. Well, I appreciate you coming on the show tonight. I've been reading the book. I'm very excited to have you on here. I've been listening to some of your interviews with other radio hosts as well. And I was kind of telling people that I grew up, like yourself, a rock and roll fan. And I, I grew up in Texas, and I used to read in Rolling Stone magazine about Laurel Canyon and just how cool it sounded and all these rock and roll bands that were out here. And while my personal taste lit kind of leaned more towards the British rock bands of the t of the day. I was really into Zeppelin and things like that. I, I love the idea that there was this idyllic kind of wonderland in somewhere in California where beautiful girls and pine <laughs> trees and swimming pools and 24 hour parties existed. And uh, the governor would even hang out with these people. And so I've always had a bit of a fascination with it. So when your book came out, I had already read a couple of chapters online. I was like, I, I really hope I can get this guy to come on the show. So I, I appreciate you coming on and I'm really enjoying the book. Well, thank you very much for having me. And, uh, glad you're enjoying it so far <laughs> um yeah i mean and when i say that it, there's some pretty dark subject matter in here but i'm a rock geek and kind of a person who wants to know a lot of things so there's some dark issues in here but i'll tell you what you're doing really well with this book i mean it seems like people have grabbed onto it and you're getting a lot of press over it so i congratulate you and, and wish you well in the continued success of this because it looks like it's doing great i yeah i am uh yeah, I'm. I'm still not sure what to make of it. To be honest with you, I'm, it's it's all a little overwhelming and uh, and a little unexpected. You know, I um, you know, I, I mean, I knew my 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 hardcore fans, you know, who have been following me for many years now online, would be excited about it. But uh, yeah, it just really seems to be very well received so far you know it's got like three or four online reviews that have been overwhelmingly positive and like almost three dozen uh amazon reviews that are all but one are overwhelmingly positive and uh you know i've been getting orders from all around the world from you know across europe and from south america and australia and it's uh it's yeah, it's a little overwhelming that, that so many people seem to be aware of this book. And, you know, it's only been on the market for six weeks now, I think it is. And um, so, yeah, it's a lot to digest, you know. <laughs> and I'm feeling like my previous books are a little being a little slighted now because this, <laughs> my other books have been out for like 10, 12, 13 years. And uh, this one already has more Amazon reviews than they do. <laughs> so, but, but you is, know uh, what? This may be the book that breaks you wide open and gets people to revisit those. I know I'm going to go and buy the, the additional books as well now because I've enjoyed reading this one. So this might be the one, man, for for you. Yeah, Fantastic. yeah, maybe it's. But yeah, it's just so weird, you know, because uh, you know, in the past, my books have arrived with no fanfare whatsoever and just kind of quietly sat there on Amazon and waited to be discovered, you know, and uh, so. You know, to have a book that's already been more reviewed in six weeks than my previous one has been in 10 years, you know, is, uh, yeah, it's a little strange. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a lot to, to try to wrap my head around at this point. So, um, but I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic that it will continue to do well and, uh, you know, reach a, uh, a wider audience. So time will tell, I suppose. Well, I think one of the things that, you know, people are grabbing onto it, I mean, there's a lot of people who will most likely buy this book not fully knowing what is going to be inside of it. And you you actually address that, uh, you know, in the first chapter, um, saying that, you know, you think some people may dislike it. But I think part of the reason people buy all the book, I mean, look, we are talking about some of the uh, – some really beloved rock and roll bands here who – you know, you hear on the radio every day, all day, um, you know, we're talking about the Beach Boys, the, you know, Buffalo Springfield, The Doors, I mean, Frank Zappa, you know, these are uh, Jackson Brown. These are people that are on the, well, actually, I mean, Zappa's not on the radio that much, but still he's, he's very well known and has very devout fans. So a lot of people will buy the book. And what I like about this, Dave, is that these people who purchase this book wanting to hear about their, the rock stars that they love so much may actually have their mind opened to a whole new level of possibility 
I, I like rock and roll and I like these types of stories that you're telling, but I know not everyone's like me and would never even conceive that there are the connections that exist that uh, you are putting in this book. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, I mean, a lot of people do not even realize just how many uh, people came out of that canyon in a very short amount of time that became just these huge, huge iconic artists that, you know, like you say today are like household, you know, household yes. names and that you can hear every day, even now on, you know, classic rock stations all, you know, all across the country. I mean, everyone from the doors and love and the birds and Buffalo Springfield and the mamas and the papas and Frank Zappa and the mothers of invention, the monkeys, the beach boys, three dog night, Alice Cooper, uh, Crosby, Stills, and Nash, Crosby, Stills, Nash, and Young, Poco, the Flying Burrito Brothers, um, probably a whole bunch of others that I'm leaving out. I always do because there's just so many. It's, it's, it's uh, you know, uh, the Eagles. Um, and then the, all the singer-songwriters, you know, James yep. Taylor, Jackson Brown, Joni Mitchell, Judy Sill, Judy Collins, Carol King, um, the songwriters like Paul Williams and uh, I, Warren Zevon before he became known. Uh, just, just an amazing array of uh, artists that came out of there. And, um, and yeah, and, and, you know, to this day, you know, the, the people just revere these, the, these people, you know, they're, they're still very much iconic figures and, and there's a tremendous amount of interest in them. And, um, and so, you know, there's no doubt in my mind that a percentage of the people that stumble across this book are, you know, <laughs> aren't, aren't going to find it that it's exactly what they think it is. Right. You know? <laughs> and because, you know, I mean, in the past, my books, you know, there hasn't been a lot of mystery, you know, and, you know, if, if you if you look at my, my previous titles on in like Amazon in the section where it says, you know, like people who are pre people who shop for this book also looked at, and, you know, there are all these conspiracy titles, you know, but with this one, there's some of that, but also you'll see in there, you know, that people that looked at this book also were looking at Michael Walker's Laurel Canyon or Barney Hoskins Hotel California or Harvey Kubernick's uh, Canyon of Dreams, you know, the, the more mainstream uh, tellings of the Laurel Canyon story. So yeah, some of the people that, that get it might be in for a bit of a shock, and uh, you know, some of them will will find it very intriguing, very interesting, and you know, some of them will probably be prone to dismiss it. You know, it's, especially the people that really don't want to let go of their idols. You sure. know, and um, so yeah, we'll we'll you know, it, it, it's are the, uh, monkey, are the monkeys not real? Is that what you're talking about? <laughs> 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 and well, then, the of course, also, my dreams. There's also the Charles Manson thing. You know, I mean, Charles Manson weaves his way through this entire storyline, and there's there is still to this day just intense fascination with Charles Manson. You know, I mean, you could fill a whole section of a bookstore with with everything that's been written already on him, and people just can't get enough. This so, is true. you know. So in addition to my, you know, my usual audience, you know, there's, there's a huge potential audience of, of people who, you know, are interested in one or more of the artists, you know, that were involved in the scene. And then, the, you know, the serial killer Charles Manson uh, type people that, uh, you know, can't get enough of that. So, you know, there's a huge potential, way more so than anything else I've ever done uh, for, for real crossover potential, you know with this book and um it just remains to be seen you know uh, how 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 many hands it gets into i guess so well hopefully we'll entice some more people tonight to buy it i want to jump right in so that because we've kind of uh, told people a little bit about these rock stars that they're expecting to hear about but they're probably saying okay michael but why is this interesting and why is it on your show so i want to go all the way back to something that dave and i, I live here in, in in la um you and i discussed you know the fact that we live in la earlier today on the phone and you know what this thing this lookout mountain laboratory 
Dave, we've got to talk about this because <laughs> this <laughs> this is a strange facility that I had never heard of until I read your book. And when we start weaving all of these tales later in the show about uh, potential ties to these rock stars, to military intelligence, covert or ops, this to me is a good way to kind of get people hip to this idea that, look, Laurel Canyon was not just fairies and unicorns and rainbows and moonbeams and all that. Well, maybe there's some moonbeams, but uh, – <laughs> This, let's talk about Lookout Mountain Laboratory. Explain to people what that was and how that came about. Yeah, I had never heard of it either. Um, you know, I've dug pretty deep in, into the conspiracy literature and, you know, poked my head into some pretty dark corners. And sure. I had never seen or heard any mention of this facility that's, you know, right here in in, uh, you know, the Laurel Canyon, right in the, in the L.A. neighborhood. And, and um that's one of the things that really inspired me to look into this whole story um, was the reference to it that Michael Walker threw out in his uh, Laurel Canyon book and just kind of as a little throwaway fact. Um, he, it was literally like one sentence, you know, he was, he was talking about something that didn't quite fit the, you know, the hippie piece of love vibe. And then he threw in just, you know, parenthetically threw in, you know, also not seeming to fit in was the covert military installation. Right. <laughs> and then, it, and then he just moved right on and I'm like, whoa, dude, back up there. That's, you yeah. can't just, that's not the kind of thing you just toss on the table and then walk away from, you know? That is like, not give, a crumb. Yeah. What are you talking about here? And so I started looking into it and sure enough. There was indeed a covert military installation in full operation, uh, beginning well before the the '60s, uh, you know, music scene, and, and carrying on through at least until 1969, when it was officially decommissioned. But uh, some reports claim that it was active even longer than that. But it, it absolutely was in operation during the uh, the canyon's heyday. Um, you know, from through uh, from when the birds first first kind of kicked off the folk rock revolution in 1965, I think, uh, you know, through at least 1969, and uh, so yeah, all of these all of these hippie, you know, peace, love, and understanding types just were all huddled, or literally huddled around a covert military installation that officially, at least, served as a uh, a film studio. A, right. a, a a fully equipped uh, in-house, the only film studio in the world, reportedly that had all everything they needed, you know, soup to nuts to make films in-house without having to shop anything out. They had an animation department, special effects department, film vault, sound stages, you know, audio facilities, just everything everything you could possibly need, uh, state of the art facility um, hidden away in uh in laurel canyon and that 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 at least was the official function but it was kept so well hidden for so many years that you know it, it's hard to say what else could have possibly been going on there you know i mean dur during the time it was in operation it was completely unknown and up until very recently it was uh completely unknown even within the conspiracy community that's um, right yeah so so, you know, I mean, that set off all kinds of alarm bells, you know, <laughs> I mean, is that just a co is that just a coincidence that this, this place, this, this isolated LA neighborhood, this isolated bucolic little, uh, you know, slice of LA where the hippie movement and the folk or, you know, this whole music revolution was kicked off, just happened to be <laughs> of a covert military installation right smack dab in the middle of it you know so that that was that was the very first clue that something just didn't seem quite right here you know yeah. it, it's really strange i found this pdf today that um came from the national nevada national security site you probably already seen it but just to give the audience an idea here's what they say about it the lookout mountain air force station studio was comparably equipped to major film studios possessed one full stage two screening rooms the ability to process 60 millimeter and 35 millimeter motion picture film uh, they had optical printing capability still photography laboratory animation editorial 17 climate control film vaults support facilities bomb shelter 
helicopter pad, two underground parking garages. And what they said with, uh, for the audience, what they said that they were primarily doing was uh, processing and developing a lot of the footage of these nuclear blasts. But, I mean, how much of that do you need? I mean, <laughs> so I, I don't yeah, know. Yeah, I mean, yeah, they I, said that, yeah, they said they were, it was primarily to process the, uh, all the footage from the atomic, atomic uh, weapons test. But all you need is a dark room for that. You know? I, I would <laughs> think so. And, 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 didn't, and didn't you uncover that? Um, Why did they have I, to fly the stuff all the way out to, you know, to, to Laurel Canyon, you know, by helicopter secretly exactly. to this, you know, to this full service entire film studio just to process film. That doesn't even make sense. You know? And apparently and, they, they had, they had civilians as, a, as well as military people there um, from within the, the local film business. And these people had top secret clearance to work there. Yeah, I mean, huge names like Marilyn Monroe, John yep. Wayne, uh, Jimmy Stewart, you know, big name film directors like John Ford. I mean, just, you know, huge, these people that were just huge, iconic figures of the, you know, 1950s, I guess, or 60s. And uh, yeah, Walt Disney and, you know, various people. And uh, yeah, they did, they did uh, you know, some kind of contract work there. And as far as I can see from all the research I've done, they all remained mum on it throughout their lives. They never spoke of it, never spoke a word of it, even so much as revealing that this facility even existed, let alone that they did some kind of work there. And so, I would I would say, listen, yeah, I, what, what, would those, what would those people have to do with, with exactly. processing atomic weapons film, you know? <laughs> You're right. I mean, I can understand Walt Disney being involved because that doesn't surprise me at all. But what could Marilyn Monroe possibly and John Wayne be bringing to the situation? I don't know. It, it just seems very conspicuously weird to me. Yeah. And, and according to uh, according to some sources, this was like this was like a state of the art facility that actually uh, pioneered some of the technology, some of the, the you know, uh, visual and, and uh, auditory, you know, technology, 3D and, you know, all, all of this kind of stuff that we, uh, you know, that, that, that's advanced light years since then. But uh, the origins of a lot of that stuff was, was actually uh, this facility. They were, they were way ahead of, uh, um, you know, I mean, they, they were like the, the top studio in the world, yes. uh, you know, I mean, more so than Warner Brothers or, you know, any of the any of the big name ones. Uh, they had they, they had them beat, you know, they, they had uh, better equipment and more, you know, better facilities. And it was af absolutely state of the art. And uh, and there's no way that that all of that was invested just to process raw you know, uh, film stock. That, that doesn't make any sense. You know? I agree. So, or why so, actors would even be there. Yeah, it, it, it's very strange. So I just wanted people to understand, first of all, we've got this, this, this facility here that even those of us who kind of enjoy reading these type of, this type of material, we didn't even know it was there. And uh, so there's this kind of strange, deep, dark, uh, film facility that's a hundred thousand square feet in uh, on Lookout Mountain. So that's just a setup. So then we move to the '60s, and here again, uh, Dave, I've got to commend you because you kind of address all of my skeptical aspects um, going into this. Because I was talking to my wife about this, and one of the things that you cover over and over and it's it's shocking because it just it keeps coming up is how many of these young people who would go on to form these bands and not just the rock musicians but the actors as well came from families that had direct um contact uh with military intelligence of of some sort and you know some people would say well wait a minute we just had world war 2 couldn't it be that all of these kids all these you know air force army Marine brats, surely they don't want to do what their parents did. They would want to, you know, grow up and be beats, then rock and rollers, whatever was happening at that particular point in time, which I kind of get. But I, I think one of your quotes was, how many coincidences does it take to make a conspiracy? And maybe you could just run down for a second. I've got a list if you get tired and can't remember it. But <laughs> tell, t tell how many of these people had these, these insane military uh, pedigrees. 
Yeah, it's it's mind boggling, and, and 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 coupled with that, the fact that that uh, quite a few of them had had past connections, and uh, you know, before they all arrived from various parts of the country, virtually simultaneously in Laurel Canyon, um, a lot of them had past connections, you know, and and uh, you know, Jim Morrison is is probably you know the the uh the the the, the classic example uh yes. being that that his dad was the uh u.s Rear- navy admiral who was directly overseeing the gulf of tonkin incident he was the commanding officer of the ships involved in in tonkin gulf which of course was the incident that uh that led uh, directly to the Tonkin Gulf Resolution and and the first American boots on the ground or the first official American boots on the ground and and ultimately resulted in you know sixty thousand American casualties and several million uh, you know uh, Vietnamese and Cambodian uh, casualties <clears throat> and he was he was a key player in orchestrating that whole incident that that that. Uh, you know that that uh, that gathered this garnered the support of the American people for a full-on war, and uh, virtually simultaneously, here here's his son arriving on the scene on you know Sunset Strip, Laurel Canyon scene as this huge icon of the anti-war movement, and yes. you know th- th- there's a huge irony there, obviously, and yes, you know I mean the argument that I always get is well that's perfectly natural these people were rebelling. Uh, you know, against their parents, but just the sheer number of them, you know, you have, uh, you know, Frank Zappa, whose father was a chemical warfare engineer, originally assigned to the Edgewood Arsenal. Uh, Frank Zappa was actually born <laughs> on the base and went to school there, lived there in uh, military housing, uh, spent the first seven years of his life at the Edgewood Arsenal, the home of uh, U.S. chemical warfare. And, uh, his wife, uh, formerly Gail Slotman, was a Navy brat. Her uh, her dad was a, a naval intelligence officer. She came from a long line of, of uh, you know naval officers, and she actually knew Jim Morrison. They went they uh, knew each other when they were kids through Navy officer circles, and actually attended the same naval kindergarten together. And According to legend, she once smacked him over the head with like a hammer or something when they were like five years old. And um, so, you know, so and then these these same two people, like literally almost simultaneously arrive in Laurel Canyon. He as this fully formed rock icon and she as the wife of another hugely influential uh, rock icon, Frank Zappa. And uh, Frank Zappa's manager was this guy, very shadowy guy named Herb Cohen, who uh, had a history of, of uh, weapons trafficking and uh, being in the parts of the world where he really shouldn't have been when he was. Uh, you know, he had, a, he had a history that was strongly suggestive of an intelligence background, mm-hmm. uh, who, who was his manager. And his cousin just happened to be Howard Kalen, who also happened to take up residence in Laurel Canyon at the very same time, and who also just happened to front a wildly successful rock band known as the Turtles, which was another one. Uh, so you have these three three of the biggest biggest you know uh, biggest name frontmen that come out of this canyon virtually simultaneously, all having these curious past connections and all coming from the same sort of background, you know? Well, and And let me throw in Papa John Phillips, because didn't he cross paths with Morrison at one point as well? He and Mama Cass, I think, attended high school with Morrison, I think you you bring up? I'm not sure if they did. You know, I mean, they all kind of spent time in the Washington, D.C. area, Phillips. and A lot lot of these people came out of the Washington, D.C. I mean, a disproportionate number of these people just happened to come out of the Washington, D.C. area. John Phillips and Mama Cass being a couple of them. Uh, I think Peter Tork of the Monkees was another one. And uh, I don't know, several others. But um, Mike in the chat room had posted that uh, Marilyn Monroe... A.K.A. Norma Jean was working in a military factory in California when she was discovered. Interesting. I wonder if it's one Very of the possible. same. Well, maybe. Well, that I actually. Go ahead. I'm sorry. 
Oh no, I was I was gonna say talk, you admit brought up John Phillips. I was gonna you know mention his uh, family background. Please. So, yeah, his his uh, father was a career Marine Corps officer, uh, and uh, his mother, his sister, and his first wife were all three career employees of the Defense Department. Worked out of the Pentagon. And not only that, but his first wife was uh, Susie Adams, who was a direct descendant of John Adams, uh, second president of the United States. So, uh, you know, th that's another theme that runs through the book is sort of these, I don't know what you call them, bloodline families that, that, sure. that go back to like the founding, uh, the founding of the country. You know, David Crosby being another one, Graham Parsons, uh, you know, quite a few of these people come from these like blue blood families that have wielded uh, considerable power in this country for 200 plus years. Um, so, you know, that that's John Phillips. <laughs> Uh, background and and you know there's all kinds of other ones you know Stephen Stills' father was some sort of a mercenary who did a lot of contract work down in uh, various hot spots in Central America. Um, David Crosby's father did naval intelligence work during World War II. Uh, Jackson Brown was actually born on a military base in uh, post-war Germany. Uh, all three of the guys from the band America were sons of uh, Air Force yes. officers who met on a base in England that was that was known for for being something of an intelligence outpost. Um, who else? Emmy Lou Harris was from a career military family. Spent her whole childhood, you know, jumping around from military base to military base around in and around Washington D.C. Um, well, I think you also mentioned sure, that many I'm sure a bunch of other ones that I'm, that I'm forgetting. I mean, it's mind boggling how, how many of them uh, came from, from that background. It's just, but what were you going to say? Well, you, you know what? I'm going to back up a little bit because I, I was thinking about something else a second ago because you, you said that um, a lot of these young actors of the time also had military backgrounds, which we'll touch on in a second, but I want to back up to Herb Cohen for a second because I, being a rock and roll fan, I, uh, I've read a few, you know, rock bios over my life and, uh, but I was not a huge rock bio kind of guy, but, um, I read, uh, no one gets out of here alive, you know, when I was in college and things like that. But one of the things that always struck me as weird besides the fact about Morrison's father in the Gulf of Tonkin was that Jimi Hendrix's manager, like Herb Cohen, seemed to come from this shadowy, and, and I'm a really big Hendrix fan, um, came from this shadowy background, and he was extorting money from Jimmy. Um, I believe big that time. he- Big time, yeah, he was. And this guy was just no good, straight up. And um, there's, uh, there's possibly evidence that would point him as, did he- did he admit to Alan Douglas that he was involved in Jimmy's death? I don't know if he admitted it. He he had, he admitted at various times, or, or he bragged of being an intelligence yeah. operative. But he he didn't keep any big secret of that, and he was a very very shadowy, very sketchy character to say the least. He was he, yeah he was he was exploiting Hendrix uh, to an extreme degree, and uh, you know Hendrix had this really weird episode where he was like kidnapped or some you know I mean very shadowy kind of yes. vague. The details have always been really very vague and sketchy on that, but apparently he was like kidnapped for a few days or something. And uh, yeah, his, his his manager and his relationship with his manager were, were bizarre to say the least, and. Uh, and Jeffrey, of course, Jeffrey ended up dead not, you know, That's not right. long after Hendrix, uh, or he faked his death. It, it, some some people theorize, but it was like you know a private private plane crash, I believe, that uh, supposedly took him out. And um, so yeah, you know there, there was and the and the gal that that Hendrix was uh, very closely associated with also ended up dead soon. I Devon, mean, Monica, Devon, or or Monica, yeah, Devon, Devon, Devon Williams, or yes. something like that. Who got who yeah. got like tossed out of the window of the Chelsea Hotel, <laughs> and you know, so or supposedly jumped, you know. But so yeah, I mean, there was a whole string of in addition to Hendrix's own curious death, you know, there was there was a uh, and Danaman too. She ended up dead under, uh, or was it Danaman that? Yeah, some some other woman very closely connected to him. So yeah, there was a whole string of curious uh, 
you know, desk connected to Hendrix and, uh, and yeah, his, his manager, there was definitely, uh, his manager was seriously, seriously sketchy to say yes. the least. And, and, uh, and he wasn't the only one, you know, him and Cohen. I mean, there was, yeah, there was, there was a lot of that going around. So. Well, but, let me ask uh, you this. Something else strange that just showed up time and time again was the amount of suicides or quote unquote suicides that seemed to occur to the parents or surrounding families. And a lot of people go, okay, come on. You're talking about rock and roller suicide. What, what's the, uh, the strange thing, but it just seemed like a lot of their parents of these musicians, their parents would uh, commit suicide. Yeah. It, uh, to a shocking degree. Yeah. A lot of these people were, came from, uh, homes that had been, uh, yeah, were one or, or sometimes, uh, more than one parent had, had yes. committed suicide. Um, you know, uh, I mean, a lot of, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, I can, I'm, I'm having our, I think, uh, Chris Hillman might've been one of them. And, uh, I think Graham Parsons, uh, did, uh, did Terry believe- Melcher definitely was Graham Parsons was, yeah. Well, well, yeah, his, his, uh, yeah, his dad supposedly, uh, yes. you know, supposedly killed himself anyway. Um, yeah. Peter Fonda, uh, two, two of Henry Fonda's, you know, he, Wives. he, P- Peter Fonda and Jane Fonda, you know, we haven't gotten into that yet, you, yeah. but you mentioned the the young actors that were also part of the scene. And yeah, uh, two of his wives committed suicide. And uh, who else? The guy that just, the guy that uh, recently went to jail for shooting the gal in his castle, the the, the producer, uh, the Phil little Spector. crazy producer. Phil Spector. Yeah, he, yes. was, he was a child of suicide. And uh, I mean, just, there was a lot of them. Uh, I'm leaving a lot of them out. Um, one of the Manson girls, as I note in the book, takes the grand prize for that by far. She actually had three parents uh, <laughs> commit suicide, amazingly enough. Both of her biological parents reportedly committed suicide, and then she went, she was adopted, and one of her two adoptive parents uh, committed suicide. So she saw three of her, her parents supposedly uh, kill themselves. So. Um, yeah, that's, that's a pretty high bar right there. I don't know if anybody else can, can top that one, but, uh, there was a, yeah, just a, an astonishing number of these people who came from homes where, where one of the parents had, uh, had uh, killed themselves and oftentimes under situations that, you know, suggested that it may have been something other than suicide, but, uh, listed as suicides at any rate. So, so we've got all these kind of damaged, good, kind of trippy, arty people coming out here into Los Angeles before it was going to become the music mecca that it did. They're all kind of arriving here at the same time. They're young people that seem to get to travel a lot more than I ever did as a kid. Um, you know, you we read that all these guys, you know, are, they're down in Guam or El Salvador and next there and somebody's in Haiti. And I mean, all of these people are crisscrossing the country, going into third world countries, et cetera. And yet, you know, they're in their late teens, early twenties. They finally wind up in Laurel Canyon before it's blown up into this music Mecca. Um, how, how they all decided to come out here at the same time is an unusual thing. And perhaps, you know, I've played in bands, and certainly there's places that you'll want to go at different times. It seemed like there's about to be a scene there, and uh, so that's a possibility. But at the time, L.A. wasn't really a rock and roll place, and rock and roll hadn't really um, begun to have the prominent place. That, I mean, listen, you had the Beatles and the Stones in the U.K., um, but in America, this was still a new thing, and yet these people all came out here around the same time. Yeah, it uh, it just it came together with a remarkable speed, and uh, and there was there was no logical reason. You know, I have a quote in the book from Neil Young saying, oh, "We don't really know why we headed out. We just, you know, the Pied Piper was calling, or some such thing." You know, and uh, they came out from Canada, from like Toronto. Quite a few of them, the guys from Steppenwolf and Neil Young, and, and uh, you know, his one of his bandmates and. Uh, Buffalo Springfield and uh, who else was up there? I think uh, Joni Mitchell was originally mm-hmm. up in Canada, and and yeah, uh, the mamas and the papas were like down in St. Thomas in the Caribbean or something, like you know, completely cut off from yes. from from the rest. Of, and yeah, you had these people just all over the place who just all of a sudden decided, hey, we need to go to Laurel Canyon of all places. 
And yeah, you know, I mean, people look now and they say, well, of course they came out here. This is where all the record companies are. This is where all the clubs are. This is where the live music. But what they don't understand is, is they didn't come here because of that. They actually created that. Right. They, you know, they are the reason. I mean, they arrived, and next thing you know, clubs are popping up along Sunset Boulevard like mushrooms. You know, out of nowhere, you got the the whiskey and the Roxy and the Kaleidoscope and the, the zeros, you know, and... all zeros, and London Fog, and all kinds of ones that are long forgotten now. Pandora's Box, and you know, I don't even, you know, just on and on and on. Beto Litos and. It must have been All a fantastic just, time to be on that strip. Just these these clubs yeah. just start, you know. So the bands arrive. There's no real music scene. There's no real club scene. But all of a sudden, now here's all these venues for them to play. And then next thing you know, they got their own radio, a new radio station, and they got their own publications. You know, Rolling Stone starts public, and and uh, L.A. Free Press publishing. Right, you know. So it's just like. All of these pieces just seem to magically come together uh, where they didn't before exist. And, you know, so there, there was no reason initially for them to come here. But once they arrived, suddenly there was a reason for mm -hmm. them to be here, you know. Um, well, let's, so, let's yeah, use... it was all very odd. It was just a, a very odd series of events that uh, all these people from from... From all over the, I mean, not just all over the country, but even from out of the country, from from Canada. John Kay and one of his bandmates came all the way from from Nazi Germany to, to join right. the Laurel Canyon scene. You know, I mean, these these people were coming from everywhere and congregating in this one isolated geographic area that initially there was absolutely no reason for them to be there you know mm -hmm. and um so yeah it was, it was very very odd very very odd turn of events to say the least well let's use the, the the birds as kind of a test case because here's one of the things that was very strange to me when reading your book now generally when a rock and roll band forms you know you've got a group of people who've been trying to learn their instruments for a while and occasionally you'll you'll get a band who's maybe made up of people that are not technically uh gifted like a punk band or what have you but usually a band is made up of people who've been in many bands before and they've been trying to uh learn their instrument and their craft and then once they get together if they can stay together then it's an up uh, an uphill battle for a few years you know, playing some clubs, trying to get booked in clubs, trying to get good enough to uh, be professional, then to write some songs and then try to get enough good songs to uh, maybe put out an indie record or get on college radio. And then after that, you're trying to get a, a record deal with a major label. Long story short, this is a process that usually takes most bands, you know, several years. And yet here's this band, The Birds, who is the first band to to break out of Laurel Canyon, and everything went down for them in a matter of, matter of months. Yeah, it was it was astonishing, and especially considering that that the two of the guys had never even ever in their lives even played the instruments that they were assigned <laughs> to play. You know? yeah. I mean, you had you had Chris Hillman, who was by all accounts a virtuoso mandolin player. You know, a, a, but but he was a mandolin player, and he played yeah. it in bluegrass band. I mean, he completely different instrument, completely different style of music. And he's the guy that they draft to be the bass player of the, mm -hmm. the world's very first folk rock band. I mean, how did and and the uh, the drummer Michael Clark had uh, he was a bongo player. <laughs> you know, it doesn't exactly translate to holding the drumsticks in your hand. And you know, so so two of the four guys had literally never played their instruments before in their life, and yet they're the guys that that uh, you know form this literally groundbreaking band and like you say had a recording contract seemingly overnight we're in the studio cutting records and you know rec in in no time at all and uh you know well, you also these... said that someone gave them their instruments yeah yeah uh it was uh who um Naomi Hershort. I, oh. I oh was that i thought that was uh I don't know. I get confused between them I do and too. Springfield because they both, you know, I mean, they both yeah. got these big names in yeah. them, and they were they were kind of the two big flagship bands of the time. 
Um, but yeah, they, uh, well, both of them, both of them. Yeah. Just, you know, benefactors just happen to come along and, and give them all these nice, shiny new instruments that they didn't even actually know how to play. You know, I mean, uh, Gene Clark and David Crosby were passable guitar players, but certainly, uh, you know, certainly not what you would consider accomplished musicians, at least not initially. And, and the other two had never played their, their is the, the only one who was an actual act had any actual talent on the, uh, instrument he, he was hired to play was uh roger jim mcguinn who mm -hmm. uh who was a very good 12 string guitar player but um yeah the rest of the rest of the rest of them couldn't play and uh and you know most of their first album was it, it, it was written by people like bob dylan and uh pete Seeger. you know they took these uh you know folk rock classics and or folk uh classics and sort of electrified yeah, them yeah. and um you know, none other than Jim McGuinn, none of these guys actually played on their first couple albums. It was all it was all done by studio musicians. So, uh, you know, there was a very very manufactured nature to the to the to the band initially. You know, the, um, these people were literally cast more for looks than for their actual musical talents. And you know, their first band, their first album was created by taking songs written by other people, having it performed by studio musicians and then you know overdubbing some vocal harmonies from the actual band members and gotcha you know, i tell you what dave hang on just a second i hear the music i think we're going to take a break here at the top of the hour but when we come back we're going to have dave mcgowan back on and uh, start looking at some of the actors and some of the remaining weird aspects of laurel canyon this is michael parker electric pyramid gonna take a break Good evening, everyone. Welcome back to the Electric Pyramid. My name is Joe Kiernan. I would like to encourage everyone to head to Revolution Radio, freedomslips.com, uh, where you could find uh, many interesting things, including the chat room, which you'll find with a lot of fantastic, knowledgeable people, uh, many discussions covering uh, many different topics, and uh, the same chat room is used uh, covering both Studio A and Studio B. There are uh, shows running uh, in concurrent conjecture all day long, all night long. I believe we have uh, right around 80 different programs now, so you'll be able to find uh, plenty of programming that suits your need. You'll find a lot of alternative shows, uh, political shows. You might even hear uh, some interesting things about military installations in Laurel Canyon. You just never know. Mm -hmm. uh, while you're there, uh, I would also like to encourage everyone and ask that you please kindly uh, make it your way to the donation button and just uh, make a donation when you like a show. I encourage people to do it. It's very, uh, it's very easy to do. If you listen to a show, you like it, you just throw a few dollars in the hat. It really does go a long way. And uh, it it's all goes right to the station and uh, it allows us to increase the broadcast range and, and heighten the platform in which we can provide. And it, it's, it all comes down to bringing the truth and uh, the fantastic stories and interesting lost histories to everyone uh, instead of the mainstream media uh, where you're really not going to get anywhere. Uh, without further ado, I'd like to bring back Mr. Michael Parker. But before I do, Michael, I have something for you here. I'm listening. Let's see. Good evening, passengers. We are on our final. You favor life. He sides with death. I straddle the fence and my balls hurt. Mine too. <laughs> Welcome to the show, Michael Parker. <laughs> Thank you, Joe. That sounds like the inimitable uh, Lizard King. That's as the it were. Lizard King right out of the Laurel Canyon. Yes, sir. I'll tell you what, you know what, that guy, highly entertaining. And uh, I, I, I hate to say this, you guys, I'm not a huge Doors fan. I was not like Manzarek's kind of organ was not my thing. But here's the deal. Great rock and roll band. I mean, I would love to have been able to see the Doors back in the day because Jim Morrison, leather pants, crazy Dionysian tripper that he was spouting this poetry and mysticism and just drinking whiskey and kicking butt, man, that is rock and roll. I would have loved to have seen that. Me and you, <laughs> I, I can't agree more, man. That, that was the scene. 
that was the scene, man. All great clubs on a Sunset Strip back then, and uh, the West Coast is where the music was at. Indeed, the West was and, the best. And yeah, well, I'm not going to say still is. I'm, I'm the East is pretty cool too. The <laughs> East I'm is a beast, East, man. But you know, yeah. I've been out west too. You know, I lived out there, but the East so, Coast um, is my home. Absolutely, and a good place it is. You guys, we are back for the second hour. My name is Michael Parker. This is the Electric Pyramid. This is our third episode, and i got to say, man, I'm having a really good time. I'm glad that I'm here, and we are speaking to a person that, frankly, I really want to party with. This is uh, Dave McGowan, <laughs> one of my brothers from the Valley here in the great San Fernando Valley, and we're talking about his new book, Weird Scenes Inside the Canyon, Laurel Canyon, Covert Ops, and the Dark Heart of the Hippie Dream. And uh, Dave, when we left off, we were talking about the birds, and one of the things that, uh, one of the people in the birds that I, I've never, I've never n- known fully how to feel about this guy David Crosby, and I hadn't, I mean, to me, he always kind of resembled some type of court gesture, gesture. and uh, then when I read what you've researched about this guy, I mean, he's got a very strange bloodline of all these very important people, and yet he's kind of this party rock and roll guy. Let's talk about David Crosby for a second. Yeah, he's got a very impressive uh, bloodline. His uh, full name is David Van Cortland Crosby, and uh, yeah, he's he's a uh, he is a member of uh, three uh, inter intermarried interrelated families: the the Van Cortlands, the um, Van Schuyler, and Van Rensselaer families, uh, which. Again, is one of these families that goes back, uh, you know, to the very founding of the country, and uh, you know, he, there's all kinds of just just a, a, a dizzying array of uh, you know, like Civil War generals and Revolutionary War generals, and you know, uh, federal judges and senators and congressmen, and you know, just all kinds of members of his family that have occupied, you know, uh, seats of power in this country for literally over 200 years. So yeah, he, he has a very, very, very impressive, uh, lineage lineage. And, um, yeah, he, he kind of took over the birds. Uh, it started out as like McGuinn and Clark as kind of a duo. And then they added Crosby and, uh, and then the next thing you know, they had added Clark and, uh, and, uh, uh, Hillman, and uh, voila, you know, they become the birds. And um, oh, one of the things I was going to say, you know, we were talking about kind of the manufactured nature of them. And one thing that, that surprises people is, uh, it tends to surprise people is when I toss out the monkeys, you know, mm-hmm. in the mix or, or m- mention individual monkeys. And, uh, you know, people are kind of taken aback by that, like, you know, that, I, that I'm treating them as if they're a real band and whatnot. But the... Uh, <laughs> The reality is that they were very much a part of the Laurel Canyon scene. Yes. Uh, you know, I mean, you can see pictures of Mickey Dolan's uh, hanging out in, in Mama Cass's front yard, uh, hanging out and, and jamming with, with David Crosby and Eric Clapton. You know, I mean, these two hugely iconic figures. You're yes. like, what is Mickey Dolan's doing with them? He was just an actor, you know. And uh, but they were very much accepted as part of the scene. They were very much a part of the scene. They could be seen in all kinds of pictures from the Laurel Canyon days. And, um, you know, there are a couple of reasons for that, one of which is that the other artists in the canyon knew something that the public didn't, which is that the people that were actually playing the instruments on the monkeys records were the very same people that were playing on the Beach Boys records and on right. the Mamas and the Papas records and on the Turtles records and on the Birds records, you know? So uh, the Monkees weren't the only band that, that weren't right. playing their own instruments in the studio. And, you know, and then there's the fact that a lot of these people more than care to admit it, audition to become a monkey. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, you know, if they, it, it, if they hadn't have been rejected, uh, you know, people like Stephen Stills would have had a much different career trajectory than what they did indeed have. Yes. Um, so, you know, uh, you know, well, while, this, while the monkeys are viewed as this artificial synthetic band, uh, they were not far removed at all from a lot of the quote unquote real Laurel Canyon bands. Agreed. This is really uh, making some sense in uh, in regards to David Crosby because I have 
been so confused uh, for the last decade or so on why uh, when Melissa Etheridge and her wife <laughs> wanted Here we to go. have a child, they uh, got the sperm from David Crosby. And ah. I was thinking, what a choice. I mean, at this point, I think he was on his second or third liver and you know, so many other things going on. And I mean, and. He's, it's not like he's, uh, you know, built like a, a, a perfect male symbol. That Yeah, uh, he's not the perfect I, It was male just the strangest you know? choice for me. You know, it's, I, I actually referenced that in a joking right. way in the book and made that exact <laughs> same point because I wonder the same thing. I'm like, this guy's obviously, you know, not being chosen for physical attractiveness no. or, you know, <laughs> I mean, what, what, it, why of, of all the guys that they could have, why David Crosby, you know? And look I mean, at his yeah, reputation. So. I mean, the guy was always in and out of trouble, never for too long. But I mean, the guy, you know, he's not Brad Pitt. He's got trouble with the law. He's got, you know, major drug issues, kind of flaky, really just kind of seems back up. I, it didn't make a lot of yeah, sense. Doesn't, doesn't seem to be the healthiest. He's, a, he's, no. he's kind of a short guy, too. I met him once. He's a, he's a little guy. Well, yeah, short so round. Why, yeah, so yeah, kind of, yeah, the pieces start to fall. Yeah, it kind of makes it starts to make, you know, I, I thought I thought the exact same thing. That was the exact same thought that I had. Uh, you know, I, yeah, one of I've, I've been back. I'm, I'm, right, I'm right there with you. <laughs> I'm right there with you on that one. <laughs> but I mean, that really lends, uh, it makes a lot of sense in, in that regard. Yeah. But in, and, and in the fact that it makes sense, that's actually kind of troubling. Of course. And so, well, as long as we're talking about the birds, this is the perfect segue to talk about a part of the book that I also didn't know. And this is kind of the birth of the hippies because it takes us, we're going to get you guys for the rest of the hour, we're getting dark. So get, you know, put, put your big boy boots on because from here on out, it gets pretty heavy. Um, this brings us to the Palikas uh, and kind of the origin of the, the true hippie phenomena, which I think most people you know, 99 out of 100 people would probably say hippies originated in San Francisco. And yet there was this strange man and his group of kind of young to underage girls who may have been the true origin. Can you speak to that, Dave? Yeah, that does appear to be the case. That uh, that surprised me as well, because like everybody else, I have always viewed uh, the hate as the spiritual center, the birthplace and spiritual center of the whole hippie flower child, you know, countercultural movement of the 1960s. I mean, 99% of the people, that's the first place their mind goes, you know, when that topic comes up, that's, that is the place that everybody associates, uh, as being the, the birthplace and really the, the sort of center of the hippie universe really. And, uh, so I was quite surprised to find that it, that it actually started here a couple of years earlier and sort of migrated up there. And the main, uh, yeah, the main people behind it seemed to be this Vito Palikas, and his wife and his sidekick Carl Franzoni and their band of very strangely attired uh, uh, dancers. They had like this sort of freeform dance troupe. And um, his wife uh, is actually uh, opened up this sort of little clothing boutique and was, you know, according to a lot of accounts, the first one to really start selling hippie fashions. And uh, to a large extent, they were. They were the, the, the people that really started introducing the clothing styles and the hairstyles and, and the whole, you know, the whole what, what, what quickly evolved into the whole hippie look and lifestyle. And, um, and the birds and the birds and they were, 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 uh, key players in, in really kind of spreading that across the country because the, when the birds, after they, you know, got their start and kind of made a name for themselves in here in LA, they they launched their first uh, nationwide tour, the first you know band out of the out of Laurel Canyon to uh, do a nationwide tour, and they specifically took these people on tour with them all over the country to you know like these little midwestern towns and stuff, and uh, which was quite shocking to say the least to uh, you know. Uh, you know, Bible Belt America and whatnot in the mid '60s, and uh, that that was really a lot of people's very first introduction to what was soon going to become the whole hippie look and, and uh, the whole hippie scene. Um, introduced by them, yeah. And these these so. people, this 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 Palakas and his his 
his girlfriend or wife and, and uh, Carl Franzoni, his buddy, and then all these women, the way I understand it, the kind of the, if I'm getting this right, is when these bands were first starting out, really the built-in scene was these hippies that would go to the show. So then all of the just normal folks would come wanting to see the circus. They really didn't care so much about who the band was. They were hoping to see these hippies, which were these people that we're talking about. And the club owners got got hip to that really quick. Like, hey, we want these people here because when the normal people come to see the rock show and the hippies, then we need to have some hippies. And that was where these people kind of became – little stars of their own within this yeah, subculture. They, yeah, they were kind of the kings of the strip, you know. They they were let in free and uh, you know, pandered to by the club owners uh, who wanted them in in the audience and uh yeah, and yeah, in in the early days it it was as much about the spectacle on the dance floor as it was about what was happening on the stage, which also you know, help to draw attention away from the fact that a lot of these bands weren't that good, you know, uh, by, by the, by the admission of their own managers and, and agents and producers and whatnot, you know, I have quotes in the book saying, yeah, you know, I mean, these guys really could not play very well live, you know, right. but, but nobody noticed because they were so distracted by the spectacle of, and also by by the Young Turks, who you know yes. we've referenced a couple times. Perfect segue. Uh, it was very very widely advertised that people like Jack Nicholson and Peter Fonda and Bruce Dern and James Mansfield and Jane Fonda and Sharon Tate and all this whole Young Turk circle were were uh, heading out, you know, on a regular basis and, and hitting these clubs. And, you know, this was a time when, when just normal rank and file people like you and I could like literally rub elbows with uh, these, you know, up and coming, you know, people that were going to become huge Hollywood stars. Um, and so, you know, and, and, and a lot of people, you know, have admitted this, including, you know, Frank Zappa's wife said, you know, the, the initial attraction wasn't the bands. Nobody cared about the bands initially. You know, it was the, the people were coming because for the chance to, to meet in person their favorite stars and to see this crazy spectacle of these wildly gyrating, long-haired freaks, which is what they were initially mm -hmm. called, freaks. And so that was... That was what filled the clubs because nobody knew who these bands were. Nobody knew what these clubs were. These were all new clubs. They didn't have an established clientele. These bands were unknown. Nobody knew who they were. You know, they, they, the scene was was brand new. Uh, you know, all of a sudden, LA is like this music place, and and uh, you know, people didn't people didn't know these clubs. They didn't know the uh, the bands. And what initially drew them out and put these bands on the map what was was what was happening on the dance floor with the, the celebrities and with these crazy, uh, you know, these, these crazy nutty dancers doing, doing these insane things, putting on these crazy outfits and doing these insane things and on the dance floor that nobody had ever seen before. And, uh, so they were a huge part of launching this scene and really drawing the crowds and, and uh, putting these bands on the map much more so than, than the band's actual talents, you know, at least as far as their live performances, you know, this is a quote in the book from Hal Blaine, who was the drummer from uh, the wrecking, wrecking crew, crew. Yeah. Which was the actual musicians who, who recorded a lot of this music. And uh, Glenn Campbell I, I read one a, of those guys. I, I actually read a quote once from a, a, a drummer from some contemporary band, which I can't even remember who it was now, but some fairly well-known drummer uh, of the last like 20 years. And, and he said, you know, I was really depressed to find out that my, my 10 favorite drummers of all time were, were all the same guy. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Well, the, the wrecking crew, they were, they were <laughs> extremely influential. I mean, that was Glenn Campbell, Hal Blaine. Um, yeah. I can't remember the, the, the woman who was the bass player. Kay, I believe was her yeah. last name. Uh, yeah, she was actually fantastic a fantastic bass player. Play. Yeah. I mean, these people could play anything. I mean, they were they great. Could, they they'd come into the studio, they'd pick up this music and, and I mean just they, they they could do it in like one take, you know, yes. stuff that they never I mean they just phenomenal. I mean, these guys were so much more talented than the people who were getting all the press attention and all the all the record contracts and whatnot, you know, but um but I have a quote in there from Hal Blaine who says uh you know, people would cut 
people would cut these guys a lot of slack in concert, you know, because there's all this other stuff going on and, you know, sure. you, the sound systems weren't all that good back in the day anyway, you know, the sound quality wasn't all that great, but on the albums, when they bought an album, they expected the, you know, and so that's why the albums were <laughs> not recorded by the musicians who were on those album covers, you know, sure. so yeah, so it was a, yeah, there's a whole lot of stuff going on there. Um, well, well, let me, because we've got 40 minutes and so much to cover, so let me jump ahead here. I'm going to have to cherry pick all the good bits. I don't want to give your whole book away, but there's some things i got to talk about. So we've got these rock and rollers coming up. They're partying their brains out. The scene is coming up. These clubs, these uh, rock, a rock and roll station, all these things are seeming to happen in a, in a really in a really quick pace. Um, now we've got the Young Turks, who are all these actors who you mentioned, who also seem to have these weird military connections. They're all partying up in uh, Laurel Canyon. And then along comes this guy with some girls, this Charlie Manson character. And for some reason, this guy is ingratiates himself with all these rock musicians. I, I really like Neil Young, and I was very kind of bummed out to see that Neil Young was such a, you know, so enamored with, with Charlie Manson. Um, and you mentioned, I think, on another interview that I listened to you with, and you made a good point. Charlie Manson was not really a hippie. He had a completely other different thing going on. How did he wind up in L.A., and why was he so well connected? How did this happen? Yeah, he was uh, he was very much more tightly integrated into the scene than a lot of people, you know, like to admit. Um, you know, to this day, a lot of people don't know that John Phillips and Mich and Mama Cass were actually on the originally on the witness list to be called as witnesses at the Manson trial. That's but they crazy. Somehow, but I, they I somehow man they I'm somehow sorry. managed to uh, to avoid getting called and, and and largely kept that out of the press. But the, yeah, they were they were they were so close to the scene that that they were actually scheduled initially as witnesses at the trial. But uh, that's kind of, kind of largely been buried over the years. But uh, yeah, Phillips was very close. Uh, Mama Cass. Uh, you know, Dennis Wilson, of course, famously let the guy, him and his family live in his house for an entire mm -hmm. summer, you know, where he met various other people, including Neil Young, who, uh, who lobbied to get the guy a recording contract, you oh know, God. and it's just, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, you know, Brian, you took him over to Brian Wilson and, and, uh, you know, recorded demos with him. A lot of people recorded his stuff. Uh, you know, all the, all the tapes that seem to have, you know, largely gone missing and, you know, the Beach Boys famously recorded one of his songs, which they, you know, basically stole from him and retitled and, um, you know, I mean, they were very, very much a part of it, and, and and like the monkeys, you know, they they were they were largely accepted as peers. You know, mm -hmm. had Charles Manson, you know, had things gone slightly different, uh, Charles Manson could very well be just as as famous as he is today, but for entirely different reasons. Right. Um, you know how how did I he mean, wind up in L.A. because he wasn't he incarcerated as a kid or something? I mean, how did he'd spend almost all of his life, his, ju his juvenile and adult life in, in uh, various correctional facilities, prisons and correctional facilities, uh, you know, right up until uh, like March of 1967, I think is when he got out and, uh, and arrives on the scene and immediately starts, you know, establishing industry connections and gathering a following, you know, this guy's like a, you know, he's considerably older than the rest of the crowd. Most of these people are, you know, barely out of their teens and, and Manson's, you know, well into his 30s. And he's an ex-con and he's this little, you know, scrawny little little guy, not much to look at. And uh, and yet he arrives on the scene and, you know, he, he's being courted by all of the these, you know, <laughs> these, these rock stars and, and he's got people following him, you know, I mean, just this, this huge entourage of beautiful women, you know, that he's carting around with him. And he, he was very welcome in, in a lot of places because he brought all of these very young, attractive and very willing women along with sure. him who would do basically anything he told them to do, you know? And, um, 
so he was, you know, he's a popular guy to have around. So just like Vito Polika, same thing. I mean, there was a, a astonishing parallels between the two, actually. You know, P- Polikas also had a retinue of very young girls who were very ready, willing, and eager to to please their master, so to speak. Mm-hmm. And um, so, yeah, man, and, and Bobby Beausoleil, you know, his right-hand man, his lieutenant, who was uh, convicted of the uh, Gary Hinman murder, uh, he was also an accomplished musician and very much a part of the scene actually played as one of the rhythm guitarists in the band love uh when they were still the wow. grassroots before they became love and uh was dropped because they had uh the only reason he was dropped according to arthur lee who led the band was that he couldn't afford to pay two rhythm guitarists he had two on the payroll at the time brian mclean and um uh bobby Beausoleil. And he let Bobby go. He kept uh, Brian McLean primarily because Brian McLean had direct connections to Vito Palikas and his crew. And he knew that uh, Brian could leverage that to draw the crowds to, mm-hmm. to their shows. Mm-hmm. And uh, so that's the primary reason that Bobby Beausoleil was dropped or else he could have, again, like Manson, he could have gone a completely different route. I mean, both of these guys were very much a part of the scene and, and could very, very easily have, uh, you know, gone the direction of a David Crosby or a Stephen Stills instead of the direction that they ultimately, uh, that they ultimately went. Well, we all know what was going to go on to happen. And I do have a master plan here on, on my thread. So we've got this guy in the background up to whatever he's up to. And then this brings us back to the question of, all of these young musicians were supposedly anti-war activists. They're partying. They're having a good time. They're supposedly kind of the voice of a generation. Um, this is against the background of the Vietnam War, which is a horrible war. And um, so supposedly they're speaking out for the youth of America. And one would think that if they were saying all of these anti-war, making all these anti-war statements, you would think that that would – um, not be taken lightly by the establishment. And the point that you make is that, listen, all of these people were taking a ton of drugs. Um, they were not hiding that fact. Um, if they would ever get arrested, they were not apprehended for very long. And then the even more astonishing thing is that it seemed like none of these people would ever get drafted either. And they were the primary age. So you've got so many weird things all happening simultaneously that don't seem to make a lot of sense. Dark overtones, people breaking the law, having a party, and yet getting away with it. Yeah, that's yeah, the, you know, that's another problem with the whole notion that these people were sort of the counterculture rebels is uh, if they were such a thorn in the side to the powers that be, why were they allowed to continue doing what they were doing when the state obviously had tools at its disposal to – you know, uh, make life very miserable for them. And, and, and they didn't even have to use like heavy handed tactics to do so because there was a war raging and there was a draft, which is the whole reason for this scene to begin with purportedly. And, and yet almost all of these guys who were, you know, populating these bands were draft age males. And yet, I could not find a single instance of anyone in this entire scene whose career was interrupted by the war. I mean, even not even someone like the like someone that nobody's even heard of, you know, like the drummer for the Turtles, who I couldn't even begin to tell you who it was. Right. But I mean, even you know, even somebody like that, uh, not one single case could I find where one of these people had not been, in, and they received draft notices. But they were always able to to get out of it, you know, in mm-hmm. one way or another, and um, and then you know, yeah, there's the question of why the police turned a blind eye to them. You know, these people were flagrant, and what you you know, whatever you think about the laws, you know, is irrelevant. The the, the fact of the matter is that there were very pretty harsh drug laws, you know, in yes. those days still are. And these people were openly not only using and promoting the use of, but in some cases, like wholesale trafficking of drugs. You know, John Phillips admitted that he was running a wholesale drug trafficking operation and got barely a slap on the wrist for it, you know. 
and and that happened over and over again where uh where you know the, the state could have very easily dropped the hammer on these people and instead let them walk away unscratched you know and so you got to wonder why 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 were they not drafted why were they not arrested why did none of these people serve time why were there no consequences for their blatant flouting of the law you know and i have quotes from people saying that there was virtually no police presence in Laurel Canyon at all, that the police never even came up there, you know? <laughs> like, why? There's this whole right. community of drug fiends, and they're in this, and you got to understand that, that Laurel Canyon is a very kind of isolated place. There's really only yes. kind of one way in and one way out. You know, they could have very easily gone in, blockaded both ends of Laurel Canyon Boulevard and, and Mulholland Drive, and barricaded that entire community and gone and done a sweep through there and probably arrested every damn person living there you yes. know, if, they, if they had wanted to. It would have been very easy to do. And yet they didn't even send routine patrols through the area. You know, they just, they took a total hands-off, by all accounts that I found, uh, the LAPD uh, took a hands-off policy uh, towards Lower Canyon during its heyday and just let them do their thing. Um, which, which is odd to say the least, you know. Yes. So, yeah, it, it, it it makes no sense. And I mean, these people, the way you describe it, I mean, it's it's a commune from house to house. Mama Cass had kind of opened a house. All these people had houses where people just drifted in, including Charlie Manson and his folks. They're drifting yeah. in, taking some drugs, drifting out, and it's just you know, it just seems like such a such easy bust to make, and yet they weren't being made. Which brings me to my next point is when everything started to go south on a personal level for these people, they're parting really hard, bringing us back to this Vito Pelicus, who has this beautiful child with his, I guess it's his wife or his girlfriend, common law. And these people are partying. And let's talk about what happens to that child. And if it possibly has, uh, Kenneth Anger is a filmmaker who made some very dark, films and he was involved with this scene so let's talk a little bit about that what happened to this 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 young boy yeah the Vito, the godot palika story is very, very dark and ugly um he he died at the age of three he was a, sort of this golden child um who who got a lot of attention considering that he was only on this planet for three years and that his father was you know purportedly this completely unknown guy uh Kid got a lot of attention. You know, he, he's prominently featured in, in the Mondo Hollywood film. Uh, he was featured in Life magazine for some reason. Um, you know, he, he was presented in, as this sort of golden hippie child that, you know, was just a beloved, uh, you know, toe headed hippie kid and um, had some very curious connection to Kenneth Anger. He was actually. According to reports, he was Kenneth Anger's first choice to play Lucifer in his Lucifer Rising film, which um, is totally creepy. Which is bizarre. Yeah, I mean, what yeah. did what did what did Kenneth Anger? I mean, first of all, what what connection did he have to this kid, and, and what did yeah. he see in him that 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 made him believe that this little kid embodied Lucifer? You know, uh, and then and then when the kid died. Uh, and he had to recast the part. He ended up going with Bobby Bozelay, you know, which is, you know, you go, you go from Godopolikas to a Mansonite, you know, which is, yeah. is uh, a, a little bizarre to say the least, but, um, yeah, so, so he had some kind of, you know, they, they were obviously connected to Kenneth Anger, who in turn was closely connected to Anton LaVey's, you know, yes. Church of Satan and, uh, you know, there's all kinds of weird Church of Satan and, and Scientology and Process Church inter, intertwined lines going through this story. And um, But this kid ended up dead um, two days before Christmas, like on mm. December 23rd, I think, 1963. That's almost a solstice, I which say. I think, it, yeah, that's like a yeah, winter solstice. It was like, yeah, it was on the winter solstice. Uh, this kid who had been, you know... Uh, who had been handpicked to play Lucifer uh, turns up dead on the summer solstice at three, you know, just like barely three years old. And, and there's so many weirdly conflicting stories of how this happened. Uh, according to various accounts, he, 
he was playing on the roof. He was either playing on some scaffolding and fell, or he was playing on the roof of the building and, and either fell through a skylight or fell through a trap door. And then there's a couple other stories that claim that he actually survived the fall and then, w then uh, was killed in the hospital through medical malpractice. And so there's like at least a half a dozen competing stories of how this kid died. Um, and there's various abnormalities in his death certificate, uh, like uh, the fact that the authorities were not contacted by the parents after this quote unquote accident happened. They were contacted by the parents' attorneys, you know, because when your kid falls through a skylight, you know, the first person you want to call is your attorney, right? As you, you know? do. <laughs> <laughs> you don't want to call the hospital or anything, no. you know, you want to call your. So, yeah, I mean, yeah, there's just all this weirdness surrounding the death of this kid. And a lot of it to this day is shrouded in mystery. But, uh, yeah, he died very, very much in proximity to the winter solstice after being, you know, uh, targeted as sort of the embodiment of, of Lucifer. So, you know, there's a lot of occult overtones in there. Yes. And, and, and you know, to add to the creepiness factor, the... Uh, the parents went out dancing the very night, and, and this kid died at like, oh God, I want to say like 6.30 or something in the evening. Mm -hmm. And like within an hour or two later, the parents and their retinue were out hitting the clubs dancing as if nothing happened. Uh, their only child dies two days before Christmas, Christmas morning, presumably with his wrapped presents already under the tree, and the parents go out dancing. You know? And he's I been mean, hand... In, and he's in been what in what universe does that happen? I mean, how could anybody even think about do? I mean, it's just so, the whole thing is just so bizarre and so creepy, and there's just so many weird and creepy overtones to it that, uh, yeah, it, I, I I think that it takes up like two chapters of the book is just because it's just so weird. There's just so much weirdness surrounding that whole scene and. Uh, yeah, it's just, and, and Vito Pelikas just happens to be related by, through marriage to the Rockefeller family, of yep. course, you know, the guy who, who basically launched the whole hippie movement, because, you know, of course, you always think of the Rockefellers as being hippies, of course, always. so, you know, <laughs> so, so, I mean, yeah, there's just so, there's just so many weird threads Running through the Vito and Godot Palika story, it's just it's just mind boggling. Um, yeah, those those two chapters are are possibly the weirdest in the whole book. Although there's plenty of weirdness to go around, but yeah, that's that story is just very very dark and ugly. Well, I don't want to give away your whole book. I want to kind of take a different point on this now. So, so basically, what we're if I'm understanding this correctly, what could be happening here is that if this was set up in some way, it was made to look like the hippies were um, something that you just want, you wanted to be revulsed by, which then uh, makes the anti-war movement appear weak. And if some of these large rock stars and actors were intelligence assets of some sort and in on this, and they would do that in the 60s, this level of sophistication to modify our opinions on social issues. Dave, what are they doing now? Um, they're giving us uh, Miley Cyrus and Lady yep. Gaga. And, Rhea. and <laughs> yeah, I mean, we've, we've kind of reached a point now where, and people always ask me this, you know, they say, well, are you saying that, are you saying that these people were no talent hacks that that no. uh, were only were only maneuvered into the positions that they were because of of who they were? And no, I'm not saying that. I, I I do believe that some of them are over are vastly over. I think David Crosby personally is vastly overrated. Agreed. Um, and, and a few others, but you know Frank Zappa, you cannot deny that the guy was just a phenomenally talented composer, musician, yes. uh, arranger, producer. You know, you name it. He he was just phenomenally talented guy. Arthur Lee was phenomenally talented yes. guy. You know, and, and quite a few of these guys. So uh, they were talented, but you know, I'm not saying that. But what I am saying is, 
you know, they weren't the only talented guys in the country. You know, this, this was a period of time where every kid in the country was picking up a guitar and growing his hair out and wanting to front a rock band, you know? So you, yeah. the question becomes, why, why to such an astonishing degree were the ones who, who were promoted into superstardom happened to, you know, come from that background? Um, I forgot what the original question was. Well, <laughs> well, my, my, my point is, is that this is what I love about your book, because somebody might pick the book up to read about Buffalo Springfield or, or whomever are the doors. And this is a person who has maybe never even considered the ideas beyond. Uh, they didn't. OK, a person that picks up this book might think they're just getting a, a book about the rock and roll bands they love from California. But what I like about it is the fact that they might somehow have their mind opened up enough to like, are you kidding me? Do you really think that there would be aspects or potentially rogue aspects or aspects of intelligence that would go so far as to try to modify our opinions on certain things by creating rock stars and movie stars and putting people in places um, where they would have access to, to uh, social opinion. I guess what I'm trying to say is I, I think that this book can open a lot of people's minds up to ideas that they would have shut out before, which may put them yeah. on a track towards discovering other things that many of us discovered a while ago. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it's, uh, yeah. And, and I, I remember, I remember now where I was going with my other thought, which okay. was the, the, the talent issue. And, um, you know, I, you know, these, I, I, I think the, you know, the star making machine, so to speak, has progressed so far from then, from, you know, from where it was then that, uh, Talent has really become kind of almost secondary. You know? Absolutely. So, you know, I've, these people did have talent, regardless of how they got in the position that they were. A lot of them did have talent. And if you look across the musical horizon today, you see these people that just seemingly arrive out of nowhere as these just massive, huge just unfathomably huge stars that can put out YouTube videos that get a hundred million hits in a week, you know, and mm -hmm. just have these massive worldwide audiences. And I don't believe that anyone can honestly tell me that that, that kind of fame, you know, in the hands of a, a Lady Gaga or a Rihanna or a Beyonce or a Miley Cyrus or a Britney Spears. How, I mean, the, the the, fa the level of fame and, and, and recognition is so wildly out of whack these days with actual talent, you know? Right. And it, it seems like it's just we've come to the point where all they really need is a marketable face and image and they can make you a star, you know? Certainly. And And there is a reason for that. And, you know, these people have tremendous amount of, uh, of power. You know, I mean, as as a lot of people pointed out, the, these the, in the 60s, these were not just musical stars. They were spokesmen for a generation. You know, they were looked up to as the spokesmen for the entire youth generation of the 1960s. And so their words, their actions were hugely influential. And, yes. you know, so it's not that really that hard to understand why why people would seek to control those voices, you know, and uh, continuing right up in, until today. And, and I think it's much more obvious today. And, and the the symbolism that's on display in videos and on these real high po profile performances, like at the award shows and the, and the Super right. Bowl halftime shows and stuff. Right. Now. I mean, I mean, it's pretty much in your face now, you know, it's, uh, it's mind boggling really. And, um, so yeah, me, we, we've come, a, we've come along, you know, the sixties almost seems like a, a, kind of an innocent time, you know, where, where talent was still valued and, and uh, <laughs> and they were still making good music, you know, at least despite all these dark undercurrents, uh, the music that you can't argue with the music that came no. out of it, you know? Well, so. let me, let me even raise the ante up a little bit more, Dave. Um, not even going with the musical aspect of it. I get, here's what I'm wondering at that time, really rock and roll music, pop culture was movies and music. And that was the fulcrum. That was the primary point 
of popular culture. So rock and roll being the uh, the medium that was coming out of music, that was pretty much the most powerful form of pop culture of the time, that in movies. And now, I'll ask you this, I would wonder, and I'm sure you know, listen, uh, people have probably already talked about this, but I would think today that those same intelligence communities may now have moved into Silicon Valley or creating video games. What I'm saying is that the ways of modifying humanity's behavior, especially in America, um, you would use whatever the most state-of-the-art popular culture tools were at the time. And I do think, you know, who knows, man, Angelina Jolie's probably an intelligence asset. I mean, she's just dying to be, you know, uh, Miss UN, Miss, uh, you know, Council on Foreign Relations. Who knows? Maybe she just. You know, I know. Yeah, I know. You know. Yeah, and uh, or yeah. How about Bono? You know, right. I, I used to, I used to love you too back. Me in, too. Like, the, the, the Unforgettable Fire. I'm a huge and, uh, fan. Joshua Tree Days. I mean, I have all their all their original yes. stuff. On, you know, I mean, I, I just loved them. And then next thing you know, the guys traipsing around Africa with the, uh, you know, the president of the world bank, you know, right. <laughs> like, whoa, yeah, maybe that, he's that... not on our, maybe he's not on our side after all, you know? And yeah, it's, you know, it's, uh, you know, yeah, you see, it's, it's a, it's an ugly world we live in, you know, and uh, the people, the people that are propped up as the people that we're supposed to look up to are not always what they appear to be by any stretch of the imagination. And, um, uh, yeah, you got you got to be very careful in in choosing your uh, choosing your icons, choosing your heroes, you know. And, and they know that we'll follow these people wherever they lead us, you know. Yes. Um, well, well so. here's another thing about like the Lady Gaga's and things like that because I, I have young daughters, and you know, and I like music, and I try to stay up with what's going on. And you know, when Madonna did the Super uh, Super Bowl halftime, um, when Lady Madonna, I'm sorry, Lady Madonna, uh, Lady Gaga. Uh, had the, the the videos that supposedly had a lot of luminary uh, Im uh, Illuminati imagery. I, I'm to the point, Dave, where now I don't know if they're doing it because they're trying to put these symbols out there to let us know, or if they're doing it because they want us to think that they're into that. I mean, it's so convoluted now that I don't, you know, is Jay-Z into Illuminati imagery or are we just getting played? I, I really don't yeah. know. I don't know, but it's it's certainly in your face. I mean, there's yes, entire web yes. there's entire websites out there now that that break down every new video That's and right. every new performance tape that comes out of the Grammys or whatever, and they'll point out to you every single Masonic symbol or you know the, it, it, every occult symbol and and point out you know how blatant the uh, the occult symbolism means and you know what it all signifies. And I mean, it's all right there in your face. You don't have sure. to. You don't have to spin records backwards or drop a couple hits of acid and stare at, you know, Beatles <laughs> album covers for, for a couple hours to find it. It's right in your face, you know. Right. You can't miss it. So It's the best place uh, to hide. Yeah. Out the open. So. <laughs> well, um, Dave, I know you've got a, uh, a book signing coming up at Book Soup here in uh, Hollywood. I believe that's on I, June 22nd. I do. I'm very excited about that. It's really my first, I mean, after all these years of, you know, laboring semi-anonymously on the internet, it's my first real chance to get out and meet my public, you know, meet my, my re all these people that have, that have so, I mean, I, my fans are just absolutely, my readers are absolutely the best. I mean, they just, they have been so supportive of me for for so many years while I've you know worked here in semi obscurity and poverty, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you know I'm 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 really excited to to find you know I mean there's people I've been you know they've been keeping in touch with by email with me for years and whatnot and I I have no idea how many of them are close enough to the L A area to to be able to attend but to the extent that they are in the area I'm. Uh, I'm very excited to to actually you know get out and and you know to, to actually get out and meet these people and uh, you know uh, rub shoulders with uh, with some of these people that have that have been so supportive and of my work uh, you know all these years. So well, I'm yeah, excited. It's uh, June 22nd, which I think is the summer solstice actually, and I I, I don't know very how appropriate. I happened. 
My my publisher picked the release date for my book, and he picks April 30th, you know, while pretty one of the most notorious yes. occult dates on the calendar. I'm like, really, dude? Did you? Yep. And he he claimed ignorance. So I wrote him. I sent him an email. I'm like, really, dude? Is that, like, deliberate? And he's like, what are you talking about? It's just it's just another day, isn't it? Not and really. Like, oh. I said, ah, you got a lot to learn about the world. <laughs> and uh, well, so, yeah, so, so so somehow my book ends up being released on, on Walpurgis Nacht, and my first big public appearance is on the summer solstice. So, I mean, I guess it's kind of appropriate in some way, I think but so. it's just kind of tonight, weird tonight to work out that way. Tonight you're on during a, a full moon on Friday the 13th. Oh, Indeed. my God. I'm sorry. <laughs> 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 Yeah, oh my god, it's a big bright one, isn't it? Wow. Yeah, I didn't mean to, I didn't mean so, to completely creep you out. There, there you go. Yeah, I don't I mean, I don't know. It's all strangely appropriate, I guess, to a certain synchronicity or something. Um, you know, the famous line from the police who are you probably haven't gotten to that part of the book yet. There, I, there I know that that's the one of the last chapters. <laughs> I'm probably about two hundred pages in, so I haven't I haven't got to the police chapter yet. Uh, okay. So well, I don't want to. I don't want to spoil anything for you. So. I know Miles Copeland and all that's in there. I did peek towards the back, but um, I think the last chapter I was on was I was actually beginning. Uh, I was going to start the Steppenwolf chapter, which is kind of a bummer because I wanted to be able to add more to the story about love, but I haven't gotten to that chapter yet. It, it's weird because a lot of these bands. That, um, that I, band is that is one of the toughest bands to dig up accurate information about. I'll tell you, man, they are so cloaked in mystery and. Uh, you know they they were regarded as absolutely one of possibly the best yes. band mu musician wise on the strip, yeah. and yet never you know I mean they were label mates with the Doors, considered much better musicians than the Doors, and uh, Arthur Lee was just a phenomenal talent, a vocalist, Indeed. composer, music, multi instrumentalist, you know, arranger, producer. You know he wore all the hats. You know. Um, just like Brian Wilson and, and Frank Zappa. You know, these guys were just phenomenally talented guys. And uh, yet Love never never really made it, you know. And then uh, a lot of the a lot of the members of the band uh, seem to have come to, you know, rather tragic ends. Yes. And, uh, and, and there's just so much mystery shrouding them uh, to this day, you know. And, um, you know, and then the, the weird fact that they had a Manson member as an actual band member who, who's now, you know, <laughs> who's now sitting in prison for the rest of his life. And yeah, uh, yeah the, the love story is, is a, is a really odd one. And I, I wish I could have gotten a more detail than what I did. I dug up as much as I could, but uh, yeah, that, that's one of the toughest bands. The, the, the one that's even harder than that is the band. seeds, the seeds with sky Saxon. That, yes. uh, their big song was pushing too hard. Yeah. And they, they were all closely tied to the source and father Yod, who then ended up dead and, who was this ex-Marine guy, and, uh, you know, he ran this uh, vegetarian restaurant that was just laced with all this Masonic symbolism, and then he went off to Hawaii and supposedly died in a hang gliding accident. And As you do. <laughs> that's a whole weird... That one, I didn't, didn't even get into the book because I was unable to even to find enough to really put together a workable chapter, which was one of my big regrets. Because I know there's a really, really bizarre story in there somewhere, but uh, very hard. The, those those two bands are are very much shrouded in mystery. Love and uh, the Seeds, mm -hmm. and and largely forgotten by most people except for real hardcore rock fans. Did you? There were two people. I know we're almost out of time, but there was two people that I wanted to ask you about. And um, this may come out of left field, but did you? I actually really like Burt Bacharach. Did you? And he was certainly not part of the Laurel. Uh, canyon scene but he was certainly a giant in popular music in la at the time did he mix with these folks at all not that i i ne no, the name did not come up in any i mean i've i've read yeah. everything i've read yeah. everything that i could find every book magazine article web post every <laughs> every i devoured everything i could find that's ever been written on the scene and i did not find uh any no i well actually no i'm glad to hear that but i've um, seen <laughs> so Lee, you can still keep, you can still keep one of your heroes, right? Yeah. You still keep one well, here's a, here's another person that I um I was wondering about that could potentially go on the uh, Laurel Canyon death list, and it's an obscure thing. But uh, Terry Kath, who was the the guitarist for Chicago, in like seventy six or seventy seven or something, the guy like blows his head off accidentally, and I think that his wife 
was sitting right beside him, and she went on to marry Kiefer Sutherland, I believe. But did you come across anything regarding that? I did not. I wish you had told me that several months ago when I was squeezed <laughs> in the. There's just, I mean, I'm sure I left out quite a few of it. The, there's a staggering number of deaths, which we didn't even get to that part. Just yeah. the rivers of blood running out of that canyon. Incredible. Which again, which, and all yeah, the houses again, burning just, down. This, yeah, it's just, there's such a backdrop of violence and violent death that is just in such stark contrast to the whole peace, love, and understanding vibe that we're supposed to associate, you know, with the scene, and, and uh, you know, and just just a, a, a just mind-boggling array of uh, curious deaths, or, you know, including the Manson murders and the yes. Wonderland, including the two most notorious mass murders. In the in the history of the city of Los Angeles, which were both directly connected to Laurel Canyon, one of them actually happened in Laurel Canyon, mm -hmm. and uh, so yeah, it's just you know that's a whole other aspect of the well, scene that's that's this dark and ugly is how many people came to unfortunate ends that were either in people either killed either in Laurel Canyon or people directly connected to the scene who came to very unfortunate ends, often under questionable circumstances. Well, those, these are all reasons for people to buy the book, and I hope that they will because uh, your Facebook, uh, which we'd, I'd like to guide people to, it's just facebook.com, of course, forward slash weird scenes inside the canyon, or go to Dave's website, which is Dave's Web, that's D A V E S W E B dot cnchost.com, where you can get autographed uh, copies of this book from Dave. And Dave, Brother, I, I hate to tell you this, I I did buy your this copy on Amazon because I wanted to. Get, ah, I, knew you I know. <laughs> I I wanted to get it in time to to read it, and uh, so I want to encourage everybody else to buy it directly from Dave if possible, and uh, you'll get an autographed uh, version of the book. And it to me, it's been a real uh, a real fun yeah. ride, and, and it'll um, be worth it'll be worth tons of money when they kill me off one of these. <laughs> so, yeah. Absolutely, <laughs> eBay that bad boy. <laughs> but Dave, I really I really appreciate you coming on tonight and 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 spending your time with us because it's been a lot of fun for me. I, and I appreciate I, you having me. I really enjoyed it. it was a, it was a, yeah definitely thanks, one of the yeah, great time. one of the more, one of the funner interviews that I've done. A couple of well, them have been kind of a challenge, but uh, this one this one was really good. Well, I'm going to try to come to your um, book soup signing. They probably won't let me in with my copy, but I'll just buy one of your other books that day. And uh, yeah, man, we, we got to go have a drink or something at some point because I've got a lot of things to tell you that I didn't uh, get around I to you tonight. I told people on Facebook that, you know, I'm more than, uh, you know, I'm totally up for, you know, going out and there's all kinds of little bars and clubs and stuff along Sunset. I would be totally up for, you know, I, I have no idea how, how long this event lasts, but, uh, are you going to yeah. do a reading at all or are you just, going I know, to just you know, I asked them and they said it was kind of up to me. He said, you know, some people come in with kind of a prepared speech. Some people actually read from the book. Some people do it as sort of a question and answer thing, and some people just give a very short presentation and then just have people line up for, you know, to and then talk to them one by one as they, you know, I mean, I don't know. I don't know how many people are actually going to buy books. I think a lot of my fans have probably already got sure. it and just want to come to meet me. So I, I don't know how many, how many books Book Soup is actually going to sell at this event, but uh, well, I we wish, we wish you well. I, I kind I kind of prefer to do it as a question and answer thing. It's just gotcha. easier than than trying to come up with stuff off the top of my head, you know. And just so I, you know, I don't know. We're just gonna wing it and see how it goes. I have no cool. idea what size crowd to even expect or anything else. I, you know, it's I don't know. It's coming up soon though, so it is. So you guys, I know we're I coming up. Nervous, on. and we'll see how it goes. So. Well, don't don't be nervous. You'll be great, Dave. Thank you so much for appearing with us tonight. I know the show's almost over. Like I say, go, guys, go to his Facebook page, Weird Scenes Inside the Canyon. There's lots of great photos. There's more uh, really cool, groovy facts about the book. Dave, I've, th I've thoroughly enjoyed it. Joe, thank you for producing tonight. And uh, man, this has been a blast. Next week, we've got Chad Meek, uh, the nephew of uh, our boy, uh, George Van Tassel. So we'll be getting our UFO on and uh, Giant Rock and all that kind of weird stuff. But um, Joe, anything else before we uh, uh, put no, a bow on this one? For, thank you for the great entertainment. Uh, both of you, fantastic. It was a great program. Uh, I wish it went on a little bit longer, but uh, it Got to leave a little bit more for the rest of them. Live long and prosper, <laughs> you, gotta, you guys. You, 
Always got to leave them wanting more. It was a pleasure, <laughs> Dave. It was nice meeting you. Dave, yeah, thanks. I, was, uh, I, I had a blast. Thanks a lot, you guys, and uh, have a good evening, night. Well, I guess it's night now, so uh, yeah. Enjoy it. <laughs> Enjoy it. Right. the 13th. Good night, guys. Good night. All right. Night.